and gentlemen, uh, my name is Josh Volb, the chair of ACTC, Arlington Committee on Transportation Choices. This meeting is being recorded and will be available for public viewing in accordance with the state of emergency uh, provisions as determined by Arlington County. Uh, so please know that you are being recorded um, and any uh, fashion discretion indiscretions will be noted later. So. Um, Thank you all for uh, being along with us for this. My name is Josh Fulb. I'm the chair of the wonderful staff uh, liaison for this is Kristen Haldeman. I want to start by introducing our newest member to ACTC. Alistair, I see you already know some people. Would you like to give the 30 seconds about you? And you're on mute. Yes, it's so good to see you. Also, I got my Arlington fair shirt on. I realized that just came to my mind. Um, uh, a great fair. It was really good to see Libby. Alistair or Alistair? I am I am immensely impartial because we, we are all familiar with the Alistair apartment complex, which is in South Arlington, and that's with an ER. So it makes sense to call that Alistair. Mine is A-I-R, Alistair. And there are plenty of Alistairs who go by Alistair all over the world. But into the uh, more um, about me, I was born and raised in Arlington and I was on the Complete Streets uh, Commission, still am, um, because I'm a big, big fan of my electric unicycle. Um, and I uh, heard that there was an opening um, uh, on this and I, I felt that it was very important that someone from the Complete Streets Commission serve. And I, I thought it was actually required and no one else was interested um, because they were too busy. So I, I, um, raise my hand. Well, we are very right. glad you are here. Um, what I'm going to do is just so you can see who is here on the committee. I'm going to run down my list and I'm going to line you up three in a row. If you'll just say hello, who you are and where you come, like what you represent. Um, and we'll see if we can get through this in about two and a half minutes. Um, Janet, I'm going to have you go third. So two other people, so you can unmute in a second. So uh, go Cecilia, Chris, and then Janet. Okay, hi, um, I'm Janet Valenzuela. I'm a parent leader from the APS and a community advocate. And I've been uh, previously the co-chair of the uh, ACTC and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Cecilia. Yeah, hi, um, this is Cecilia Sapella. Um, good to see you, Josh and everyone else. Um, I am joining you guys as the liaison from the facility, the FAC, the uh, Capital Projects and Facilities Committee, and I've been a previous member and chair of the Budget Advisory Committee. So well, happy you. to join you guys. Thank you. So Chris, then Dennis and Elizabeth. Uh, Chris Slatt, liaison from the Transportation Commission. Wonderful. Dennis? Dennis Leach, Director of Transportation Arlington. Elizabeth. I'm Elizabeth Kiker. I'm a parent of two kids at Gunston as of this year and one kid at Montessori Public School of Arlington. And vice chair of this committee. She's trying to duck that underneath. Oh, that. right. Yes, of course. Uh, Lauren Way, then John Carden. Hi, Lauren Hassel, Safe Routes to School Coordinator with APS. Uh, good evening, Hui Wang. Uh, Arlington staff in transportation engineering operations. And John? And I'm uh, John Carton, chairman of the Transit Advisory Committee. And then we'll go Libby, John Mickelweiss, and Zara. Libby Garvey, and you know me. I'm liaison from the county board. Nice to be here. John Mickelweiss. I work for the audit committee of the APS school board, and I'm an APS commuter. Hi, I'm Zara Seastrunk, and I'm the liaison for Arlington Transportation Partners. It's nice to meet you. Well, thank you all, and Alistair, thank you for joining us. And so uh, I am going to now bring up the... I do have a quick question. Yes. If I may. I just uh, am trying to get everyone's liaison information just so the next meeting, I'm not starting from square one. Zara, may I ask, 
is that a um, that's not an Arlington commission that you're a part of? No, no, we're um, under Arlington uh, County Commuter Services. OK, got it. Yeah. Oh, and joining us is John Armstrong, who is past chair. Hold on a second. I hit admit. Um, so John Armstrong just came in to us. John, say hi real quick. We we're just doing a round of, inter of highs before we go to the next thing. Hey, Josh. We have a, a, we have a new member. Today. And so Al Alistair here is joining our, uh, just got appointed and is our newest member to ACTC. And I will close this by saying I am always, we are always looking for new members to keep this committee going. It's, I think, critical. Everything starts with getting somewhere. So um, here we go. Josh, I have a quick question. Do we have someone um, who is our liaison from the BAC? We did. I will have to message them and see who they chose for this year. Sorry, was the question about BAC? Budget advisory. A budget advisory committee, as Sorry. opposed to bicycle advisory committee. I was like, that's Jillian, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, um, Kristen, I, I'm ready to drive this. If you're ready to walk us through it. Okay. Do you want to first approve the minutes? You are absolutely right. I do. Okay. So, um, the minutes were sent out to everyone, um, and we need to go through. And I got no comments on the minutes. If um, are there any objections before we just we vote on the minutes or any concerns? If I move adoption of minutes. Thank you. That was John Cardin a second. Can I second it? Anybody? anybody? This is Elizabeth Kiker seconding. Thank you. Um, if in the chat um, you if you can say yes or no or if you can't get to the chat, give a thumbs up, or if you need to just say yes. Um, anything, uh, so we have an indication on the record um, that we approve the minutes. So. Okay, so yeah. if I can get some. Yeah, and I'm a yes. I approve the minutes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I see one, two, three, four, uh, yes. I approve the minutes. OK, awesome. All right, I think that's enough. So now that uh, now that I uh, failed in one of my basic duties, which was to uh, get the minutes approved, we will move on. Are we uh, am I ready now to move on to the next part? You are. I'm going to make just a, a short announcement. I just wanted to let people know that um, our uh, that Marcus Gregory, um, who was uh, the assistant superintendent for facilities and operations, uh, resigned at the end of not last week, but the week before. Um, so uh, he, uh, I'll just so he is not going to be uh, joining us um, going forward. OK, All right. with that. OK, so Josh is going to drive for us. Uh, so I can look at my notes. So um, transportation policy and PIPs. Um, I, I feel like I've been working on this since I first started at APS, which I think I'm, I'm getting close to my four year anniversary. <laughs> so um, I think this year we're finally going to get it done. Um, so um, which is good. It needs to be done. But um, over the past, well, pre-pandemic, I had a couple working groups, internal working groups that were kind of going through, taking a look at the current policy, the current PIP, um, and really doing a lot of, um, call it internal sort of soul searching about what these things should look like based on, you know, things that we had learned over time. Um, and then, of course, you know, this past year, we've learned some more things um, that, you know, can be part of this, 
part of these documents, um, but I think uh, we're finally in a good place um, where we can begin what is ultimately going to be about a six month process um, to take the drafts and get them over the finish line, uh, which essentially means board adoption. So Josh, if you could swing to the next slide, um, I will start with this. So our current transportation policy and PIP um, is we have one policy that's simply called transportation. Um, and you can see it was last revised in 2005. Um, so it's been a while. Um, technically, you know, we're supposed to be reviewing our policies every five years or so. Um, in fact, I think it is five years um, and whether it, it is revised or updated or what have you, we at least need to kind of put our hands on it and look at it. So this one is is really overdue. Um, as you can see from the slide, um, it really it defines who is eligible for bus transportation um, and it establishes the the busing zones. Um, and it has in it um, what we call a, a service delivery hierarchy that really identifies when buses are provided really on a daily basis, how we allocate our bus resources on a daily basis. Um, and then because this was a policy that was um, transportation sort of generally also sort of stuck in there, there's one small paragraph at the end um, which was about the staff use of school board owned vehicles. Um, now this it had a bus, a school bus component to it, but it also covered our white fleet. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that element of transportation policy in a second. Um, but um, with that policy, there were two pips. Um, one that was that is called pupil transportation. The last revision to that was in 2014. Um, and in that year has this, this sort of list of things that were in it. It was um, it's about six or seven pages long. Um, student passenger safety standards, driver's safety standards. Um, it did speak to you know how we transport students to and from school. Um, there was a, a big section on athletics and extracurriculars, um, field trips, um, other programs that we might transport uh, students to and from. Um, it talked about field trip reimbursement. Um, and then again, because it was sort of broad about transportation, it talked about transporting um, home ill students. Um, the second PIP, of course, was uh, really all about the use of school board owned vehicles and that again spoke primarily to the white fleet um, that we have and it's you know when you might be able to use a white fleet vehicle or how they're assigned when you can take them home um, can you keep it overnight etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so a lot kind of baked into these these uh, this one policy and two pips so um Internally, uh, we started working with on this and um, I it was when John Chadwick was here and we had a small internal working group that was um, our transportation planning team uh, was our assistant superintendent, um, Kim Wilkes, our director of transportation and Dariba who does our routing. So we really started you know kind of digging into the transportation policy and then a couple things kind of spun off out of that um the first of which was a bell time policy and we're going to talk about that and then the next agenda item but what we realized as we were going through this policy is that we didn't have a bell time policy we didn't have anything that you know the school board adopted that said we really need to look at bell times you know in this you know sort of interval and what are the things we need to consider or how often do we do it and that kind of thing so last september and again we'll talk about this later um we had the board adopted a bell time policy after a bunch of work. So there were a couple spin offs again that resulted from the student transportation um, review or the policy review. So as we we're 
working through it, um, we decided that rather than having this policy um, sort of broadly based on transportation, because it really it didn't really address other aspects of transportation, um, other student transportation like walking and biking, um, it didn't address staff transportation. So we thought transportation was a bit too broad for a policy and we really wanted to kind of zero in um, on a policy that was focused on student student transportation, specifically um, how we provide our bus service. So we have changed the name to focus on uh, student transportation. Um, and in fact, we may even change it further um, to be something that might look more like um, school bus transportation or something along those lines, which uh, some of our, our peers in Virginia um, also call it you know, student transportation or student bus transportation. Um, so some similarities uh, with the old policy still defines who's eligible for a bus um, and establish, establishes busing zones and when buses are provided through that service hierarchy. Um, but it does go ahead and removes that staff use of school board owned vehicles. Um, and we're going to create a new policy and assign the PIP um, the current PIP to the new policy. So we're going to take it out. Uh, and then the other thing that we have done is again through our conversations, we realized that um, again, the general that pupil transportation PIP was really long and it had a lot of stuff in it. Um, and we wanted to break it up. Um, so we've created three PIPs, uh, one that focuses on general education transportation, one that will focus on special education transportation and the other one um, that focuses on other types of transportation, other types of student transportation in particular. So um, as I said, the uh, the rationale for the PIPs was really that um, Gen Ed one or the the existing one was just way too long, uh, contained too much info. Um, and with the special education transportation PIP, uh, it wasn't last fall, it might, I think maybe in the fall of 2019, um, I met with, uh, or we hosted a little workshop, um, actually it might even have been earlier than that, with the special education um, PTA and ASAC, um, which is the advisory, um, it, it's the Arlington Special Education Advisory Committee. Um, and we had a transportation workshop and one of the results of that was that we really needed um, a PIP, a policy implementation procedure, um, kind of letting people know how that process works. Um, we didn't have one. And so I think it's, um, you know, we've moved in the direction of creating this new one. And then again, the other student transportation with uh, all the other transportation that we provide um, but they kind of have their own processes and really needed and have been um, and can be treated separately during the budget process. So um, I think that's sort of the rationale for these things. Um, the policy itself, um, just some things about it. Um, a lot of restructuring to make it an easier read, you know, adding things like headings and sort of administrative stuff. Because um, if you were to look at the current policy, it, it's almost sort of a stream of consciousness and it really needed some some organizations, better organization, a little clarity. Um, so one of the one of the things that we did do was create, you know, again, just a, a section that deals with eligibility ineligibility and then also loss of eligibility. So really kind of focusing on um, that bus transportation eligibility um, concept and, and the things that go with it. Um, you know, we are including some language to support the centralized stop locations for our option schools. Um, we are retaining our service delivery hierarchy, um, which supports you know, getting students home first before providing buses for anything else, including athletics. Um, and this has been kind of a, a point of contention, um, inquiry, concern, because um, it does have budget implications if we are not able to provide school bus service um, 
for athletics during a certain period of time, specifically when we are bringing students home. Um, and we are, um, we've had to hire some charter services to do this. Um, so again, some open questions still, I think, out there with our policies and PIPs. And I think as we do this, as we go through this process of revision um, and feedback, um, we're hoping that we're going to get a little more clarity about kind of what our, um, how we feel about our commitments to certain types of transportation um, through this process. So, um, and again, I already said we're removing the school board vehicles from the current transportation policy and creating a new one. But um, in terms of uh, the other student transportation, um, field trips, athletic trips, and activities, um, we're really zeroing in on um, not only when buses are available, but what the process is. And again, for me, with with PIPs, um, I see them as not only information for sort of parents and the the community, families, but also for our our own internal use. So um, I think. And again, over the four years that I've been here, you, you see, you know, people can, they, they come and go and new staff take on new roles. And sometimes um, institutional knowledge that one person might have may not be transferred to somebody else. Um, and so there's either a, a loss of information or maybe a, a sort of a re-education or new education process that needs to occur and maybe hasn't yet. So. What I like about having PIPs um, that kind of lay this stuff out is really um, that they're going to provide a lot of useful information um, about our processes. Um, and um, and I think that's that's really important um, for both both internal and external stakeholders. Um, so it's a fairly high level summary um, here tonight. Um, I'm going to pull up next, Josh, if you could um, bring up the schedule slide. Um, and you can see uh, what we're driving toward um, is uh, this. If you look at the bottom of the slide, it's that school board action, um, hopefully on April 7th. Um, which uh, April 7th, 2022. Um, and so there's a lot that we do to kind of back into that. Um, if you look at, if you go up a little bit to the top, um, you'll see that we have the public comment period. I think I highlighted that in yellow. Um, and I think today, for example, Josh, I think <coughs> you received an email about some policies and PIPs that are under review, that are out for engagement. Um, and so that starts this 30 day comment period. Um, and so the 30 day comment period right now for this policy and PIP, or these three PIPs will begin um, after the holidays. Um, but before then, um, what I'm hoping is that we can get some enhanced feedback from this committee in particular. And then also I want to pick it up from um, the uh, Advisory Committee on Special Education and the um, Special Education PTA, specifically on the new PIP, um, to get their feedback kind of before we even get rolling into this 30-day window. So if there's anything um, that we'd like to incorporate um, before that you know, larger public comment period begins, that we have time to do that. Um, so, uh, I know six months seems like uh, a long time, um, but I think it will be here before we know it. And there's a good, a good deal of work, I think, left to go in terms of review and comment and that kind of thing. So what I would do um, for this group is uh, before the 30 day comment period, we'd send out drafts of the documents so people can review and to kind of take a look, you know, just after having heard this from me tonight, I'm um, kind of think about some of the things that um, maybe you've experienced in transportation, things that we've talked about. I mean, have we captured it 
and either the policy or the PIPs. Um, is there anything else that, um, yeah, we might need to think about? So I'm going to stop there um, and happy to take any questions at this point if you have them. Let me start with um, our two callers to see if either of them have, since they can't raise their hands, um, questions on this. Okay, uh, questions from the group? Oh, I see John. And then I'll go John and then Jillian. Question I have is, um, how long is this document? The policy or the PIP, John, or one of the PIPs? Well, the combination of what you'd send out for people to look at. I'm just curious. What I will send out, we haven't, I haven't sent anything out yet. But I'm just, just trying to get a magnitude. I'm just curious how big it is. In terms of number of pages? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So the policy is, I think we're four to five pages and then the pips, um, are, let's see, the gen ed is probably the, no, actually maybe the other one is the longest. They're probably about 10 pages, maybe 13 in total. Okay. Okay. All the details seem like it could be a hundred plus pages, but I'm glad to hear it's rolled up like that. No, no, <laughs> it, it is not. It is okay, not. good. Um, Jillian? Thank you. Um, and, and thanks, Kristen. I know there's a lot of work um, and a lot of thought that, that's gone in just to get us this far, and I really appreciate it. I do hope um, that we can, well, it sounds like this is a good venue through which to talk about hub stops. I know I've heard a lot of feedback about the the way the hub stop system has been implemented, and I think it would uh, be really beneficial. I know everything was implemented in the pandemic, so it wasn't sort of the ideal uh, structure. Um, and then it was implemented this year, and I think the I think we've noticed some ways that the system could be improved. Um, so I'm hoping that this that the discussion of the pips might serve as a convenient um place to have that conversation thoughts on that Kristen? um in part um think about the the pips so the policy will be broad um pips will be a bit more specific and then internally there's also sops so there's kind of three ways and then there's also handbooks but at any rate so you can um, provide some uh, feedback on that. Um, we're trying to, I guess, with the, the way the pips go is they will be um, not as specific as say maybe an SOP might be. Um, I think it's, um, Kristen, did that answer, or sorry, uh, Jillian, did that answer what you were looking for? Yeah, I think so. And I just think um, I hope we can have the conversation. Um, well, obviously, we'll see the documents and, and that I think is a better judge as to whether what people have been talking about belongs in a PIP or an SOP. But I hope if it is, if the answer is it's really an SOP sort of thing, then I hope we can have that conversation because there's a lot of sort of um, it's impacting a lot of families. Uh, it's impacting a subset of families in a big way, uh, and I think we would improve this system overall if we talked about it. Thank you. Um, and so, Kristen, I appreciate you bringing this to us. I know the the whole transportation thing and then the fun of trying to figure out where each piece fits in the jigsaw puzzle. If you've ever tried to find a particular um, PIP or policy for something, you're like, oh, hey, it's tied in there. Um, yeah, that's always, always an interesting, um, interesting challenge. I, that the issue, I, I'm glad to see that they're talking about the idea of prioritizing getting kids home. I know when, 
my beginning of my teaching career, I made money on the side as a teacher slash bus driver because we just didn't have enough in that very critical 2.30 to 4 o'clock time when literally everybody wants to go everywhere. Um, and it's just that that hasn't changed in 20 years, except it's gotten worse. So um, Kristen, thank you. Let me change the screen share on this. Oh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Sorry, and I'm not sure if this is the time to just say that I agree with Jillian. Um, we really love our hub stop, and so just, but um, but it's at Yorktown High School, and so thus we also hate it. And so, um, just wondering if there's a time. Maybe this sounds like it's not the not time. The time. I'm really grateful really to the to the to the work that has gone into it. I just wonder if there is a time where we're talking about hub stops. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Yes, I know. I know your hub stop. I saw there had actually been comments written, and I could tell by reading them, I was like, oh, that's our hub stop. <laughs> that wasn't me, I swear. I always just write to you. Oh, no, that's okay. okay. Maybe all of these will dovetail a little bit. I can actually see the relationship here between hub stops and bell times and efficient transportation. So let's talk about that bell time project and keep us on schedule. It is the same. The bell time is the same as when the bus picks up, so it is perfect, yes. Yep. Yes. All right. So let me share my screen. Um, I, John Armstrong, I know you're in the meeting. It does not seem to let me get rid of the little thing on my screen. Uh, OK, um, it's sticking for me, too. It does. OK, well, hopefully it will not get in the way of this next presentation. All right. It thinks you're trying to come into the meeting twice, John. It's not on your end, it's on ours. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, see if I can present this. While we're um, while Kristen's bringing this up, so our intersection that we'll be talking about near the end is 12th and Rolf Street by Hoffman Boston. So if you're unfamiliar with it in you know the middle moments, feel free to um, feel free to bring up Google Maps on the side and familiarize yourself with the area around Hoffman Boston. All right, Kristen, go for it. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see. Am, am I, does ever is this little blue John Armstrong guest in front of? The screen for everybody or just me and you just Josh. you okay just you uh, none of the rest of us can see it lucky me Sorry, Kristen. okay <laughs> That's all right. um, okay so um transportation um operational efficiencies so this past um uh week we um gave a presentation to the school board on um operational efficiencies and um it was HVAC, um, transportation, and um, IS. And so what this um, presentation uh, was, um, we gave this, uh, this presentation to the board, and it is about how we go about reviewing our bell times uh, to create uh, more efficient um, routing. Um, so, you know, we've seen, you've seen these slides before, maybe in various forms, but I'm just on this, uh, the first slide I usually start out with, with any of these presentations is just to talk about some of the macro level challenges that we face that impact, um, our bus system and, and our service delivery. So growing enrollment, um, budget constraints, land, um, and traffic volumes all have an impact on, on our buses. Um, and then on the day-to-day -day side, you know, staffing, um, obviously a bigger um, concern for us this year in terms of driver shortages. Um, school start and end times close together uh, makes it, um, makes uh, on-time performance challenging. Um, student distribution, long routes, um, or student distribution for option schools, that's where hub stops come in. Um, 
challenges with a specialized transportation service delivery. And then, of course, we just talked a little bit about this athletics and activities. So um, with that set up, uh, the one that we you know wanted to talk about today is going to be the bell times. So just in terms of what we're looking like this year, you know, I usually put up this slide too. Um, we have we've got the fleet um, personnel. Um, we've got 138 drivers. Um, we normally have about, um, I think in 2019-20, we had about 169. Um, so we're down quite a few. Um, uh, Kristen, attendance, you're going to point yeah. out that that number for personnel does not add up to the number of routes? Right. Yes. Um, yep. So it does not. Um, so we have we have fewer drivers um, available than the routes that we have to deliver. So um, this has been and this has been one of the great challenges um, for this year in particular. So um, and that 138 number also does not include uh, the drivers who may call out for um, any reason. Um, you know, sick, obviously, we still got COVID floating around, and then there's other sickness and illness, um, approved leave and that kind of thing. So, you know, these days, uh, say we're short 26 drivers, and then on any given day, we could be out up to another 10. Uh, so for those of you who might be experiencing um, some, and this I've heard, you know, from some families, there's been some doubling up. Um, combining of routes um, or routes that are late. Um, this is that's really the crux of it. Um, we don't have enough drivers to cover the routes. So, so what can we do about it? One of the things that we can do about it um, is to start looking at the bell times. So you've all seen this slide before. Well, those of you who've been on ACTC for a while, um, essentially we have like eight different bell times, um, starting with at 7.50 with our middle schools and ending at 9.24 with um, HP Woodlawn um, and the Shriver program. On the dismissal side, this is where you can start to see where we run into problems with the athletic trips because we've got middle school sports that are um, starting at like 2.30 and then high school sports that start at 3.15. Uh, right now, we have been unable to serve these trips um, until 4.30 in the afternoon because that's how long it's taking us to get everybody else home. And so the, and there's no buses available to provide all of the trips that are needed. Um, I wouldn't say no buses, but we're very limited buses. Um, so we're really having to push out, um, either push the, the trips out or hire charters, which is which is expensive. Um, so when we start talking about our bell times, um, this is how many buses that are being used, you know, per bell time. And then if we start lumping them together into three tiers, which is typical for schools, you typically have an elementary, a middle and a high school tier. Um, and all of your your bell times are um, basically the same in each each tier. So everybody. So for us, for example, tier one, everybody would be at the same time, but instead we have 750, 755, 8, and then 815. Um, 88 buses for that, 88 buses for the tier two, uh, which are the high schools and a few elementaries, and then uh, tier three, which are um, most of the elementaries, um, and then HP Woodlawn. So, and that's where we get into the largest number of buses but what you can start to see is that we're um we're not balanced um and you we have um far more buses in uh sorry in uh, the that last tier than we do in the other two um the other thing that you can see and that's this last column is the time between tiers in the am and the pm and the time between tier one and tier two um, is 29 minutes between the first big slug of buses, which are the middle school buses at 7.50, and then the next big slug of buses, which is at 8.19 um, for high schools, which is 72. And so we literally have 29 minutes to turn everything 
around um, and get high schoolers um, to school on time. And then the 825s are the, are the next, the elementaries. In the afternoon, a little bit better, but not much, 37 minutes. Um, the optimal time between tiers is about 50 minutes. So even though the time between tier two and tier three is better, um, we're still not hitting that 30 minute or that 50 minute mark. Um, so what is what is happening? Um, bus reuse versus time. So the limited time between tiers does not allow us to use the buses three times every use every bus three times, right? One for each tier. Um, so if we can expand the time between the tiers and start to rationalize the start times, um, it's going to help us start to balance out the buses amongst the tiers, be able to reduce some buses in that last tier and be able to reuse them. Um, and that's really kind of the name of the game um, of what we're trying to do um, with this little project. Um, so I mentioned the school start and end time policy um, that again, it was really as we started down the path of, you know, reviewing the transportation policy and PIP that we realized that we did not have this policy framework. Um, and um, in looking at it, also realized that the last comprehensive bell time review was in 1999. Um, I don't know, Libby, I don't know if you're still on. You might, she might have had to jump off, but I can't remember if she was on the school board then. But this is when um, school systems, I think, first started looking into the research uh, that teenagers needed more sleep. And so it was about then, um, at least in school year 2001 and 2002, that the high schools started with that 819 bell time. So it's been a long time since we did this kind of a comprehensive review of the bell times. Um, we still have a number of these parameters to to look at. Um, oh, there you are. Yep. So Libby does remember. Um, but uh, the six areas we want to consider, you can see them up here, safety, proximity, on time arrival, sleep patterns, operational efficiencies, that's us and after school activities. Um, Josh, when you and I had a conversation about this, you said, well, you know, is there is there any way we can, you know, um, look at, you know, starting our high schoolers at much of a different time? And one of the issues that we have with the high school bell time is that we're uh, with athletics, we're kind of tied to the other neighboring jurisdictions who we compete with. So, so there's all this, these, things that um, considerations that kind of get factored into how we develop these bell times. Um, so, but at least we've got the policy framework to kind of get it started. And I think we, you know, I think we're starting to get the word out that it really is time to do this um, and have a look at it again, comprehensively. So in terms of the goals that we would have for this kind of a project, obviously we just talked about a big one, increasing the time between the tiers um, so that we are able to use the buses at least once, once per tier in the morning and in the afternoon. Balancing the buses, um, reducing the buses used in each tier, and then increasing bus availability for our after school, high school athletic needs. Um, because right now that that's the big one. That's the one that is probably suffering the most in terms of us having to go outside of our our school buses to um, to have get transportation. Um, so that I think is um, so that's kind of the most that you know the, the big thing that I wanted to put out there today. Now we did talk to the board about a potential timeline if if they wanted to deploy this in August 2022. <coughs> um, it's a pretty ambitious schedule and to do something like this would be um, it would have to be an extremely limited scope um, because as you can see with the stakeholders there's a lot um, there's a lot of, of outreach and communication 
um, an engagement that we would have to do sort of around this if it if it got you know if it became something else than just simply really seeing what we could do with that those time between tiers for example um so they asked for a timeline so um this is what i put up with a very limited scope so but yeah it would you know this would affect um all aspects of aps potentially you know school staff um transportation of course uh, extended day, food service, custodial, IS, you know, so a lot of different impacts. Um, so we want to be sure that we would be able to to give it due, um, recognizing that there's, you know, a lot of a lot of stakeholders involved. So, um, so that is what I had on the proposed bell time um, idea project. Um, I don't. We don't quite have a full a scope other than thinking about increasing the time between tiers. Um, but uh, wanted to bring this forward just so we could uh, talk about it. Okay, that's all for, that I had. Well, thank you. Um, questions about this? Who wants to? Uh... Um, I see Libby has a hand up and I know she's got to go. So Libby, go first, please. Yeah, I, and I just have an, a couple of observations. Um, one, yeah, I remember that study well. Um, you know, one of the things we found, and actually it was at another time, we had, I freak, we had a lot of snow days. That was it. We had a lot of snow and we had, we were forced to make up time and it got to this ridiculous thing that we would add five minutes to the day for the last three months or something to, um, you know, to try to get the time so that we qualified for what the state required us. Um, and one of the things we discovered, what that seemed like a small thing, five minutes. And one of the things we discovered was that our parents were so stressed that changing their day by five minutes completely put them over the top. So it's, it, 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 it's, so it's, that's it. And that, this isn't exactly about that, but as you pointed out, um, Kristen, that, you know, little changes, it just affects so much and you have a very stressed community. So important to be working this through and, and trying to figure it out. The thing that strikes me is that absolutely we got to figure a way to start using our art buses and Metro buses and not have the kids on all of the kids on buses, um, you know, most of the time when they travel around. I just think that's not sustainable. It's real concierge service we've got. It's great, but I'm not sure particularly high schoolers and middle schoolers need all that. We got to figure out something. So I hope we can, you know, continue this. That's why this committee got formed, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be very supportive of that um, because we're sort of on a trend that can't be can't be uh, sustained. And then finally, you know, I'll point out and you'll hear it. Do not take it badly. But, you know, a lot of times they say transportation drives the school system. So you got all the kids in school and you don't think about what's good for the kids. What, what all it is is to make the buses work. And I get that, and maybe even that's what we have to do. But that's the kind of you know reaction and pushback you may get. So you're entering a very dicey area, and I'm glad that you're having this conversation and trying to work it out. I think that's great. Um, and I'm just, I guess, mostly what I'm trying to do is give you cautionary tales that may or may not be helpful. Um, but I'm supportive, particularly of trying to figure out another way of doing it. And possibly, you know, we work through all of this. It'll be clear to. Um, everybody in the county that we got to do it differently and that may help a lot make some of the changes that we might need to make on art or, or metro or whatever um and have people be more willing to to, to make those changes because they realize there isn't really much there's not a better way to do it, it you know we kind of have least bad choices to make so and maybe they'll end up actually being good choices which would be great to get you know students used to using the the bus system we've got um already you know circulating around the county if we can work that out it would be great and um, these virtual meetings are hard. I can't see anybody's face. I can't see anybody's reactions. So I'm going to just stop talking. I'm sorry I've gone on so long. And I will hang up. And I probably am going to have to, 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 to leave you. But thank you for doing this. And it's a tough one. Thanks. L Libby, the institutional knowledge you provide on this is essential. So thank you. And the, the, you know, the historics of don't, go st don't step in that, because if you step in that, it's going to smell, you know, is important. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. Yeah, no, that's great context. I'm I'm glad you were able to still be on for this because that's 
that's good. <laughs> good I'm background. glad you found it helpful. <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. Thanks. I, I've so, got to go off soon, and thanks a lot. I'll see you. Um, let me go. I'm going to go in the order of the hands here. So it'll be Jillian, then Elizabeth, then Chris. Uh, thank you, and I was just going to thank Libby um, and and especially for her support of getting more kids in art buses because we I know we're going to talk about this, but uh, that that vote is coming up. And if we can make that as, as broad as possible and as simple to use for families as possible, that would be great. Um, I also put this in the chat, but I, I was my understanding of the state of the research now is that for children's brains, the best thing is if elementary school actually starts first and then middle and high school. And it's a common question that I get because people know that I'm engaged in, in this sort of stuff. Um, people always are like, why do the elementary schools start last? And I think you would actually, um, while yes, this matters a lot for people uh, and their day-to-day -day lives, I actually think having elementary schools start first ends up simplifying lots of people's lives. I think it ends up simplifying extended day because you wouldn't need morning extended day and and some other things. So yes, it is a big change with, you know, a, a lot of people impacted. I think the vast majority of them would be impacted for the better. And so I think we should do it. I mean, I, I certainly don't think we should shy away from uh, from doing something just because it's hard, especially when I think there will be huge, huge benefits to doing it, especially doing really looking at it and not just looking at maybe moving a couple earlier or later to increase the times, but increase the um, the time between between the tiers, but really looking at when school should start. And then to the art bus point, uh, maybe even looking at what we need to do with art buses, like if if it would be better for um, high schools or middle schools to start at, at one time or another because that actually would allow more art buses to get there before the bell time and schools and students to use those art buses. Thank you, Jillian. Um, yeah, I'm big on having the, if we're gonna rip off the Band-Aid, you know, there we go. Elizabeth? So to um, to reference to, uh, once again, agree with Jillian, but um, my husband and I lived in Seattle with our three children when Seattle schools, which has just as many complaining parents as Arlington schools, if not more, um, did this. And they moved their elementary school, as Jillian just said, elementary school, which all three of our children were at the time, to be the first instead of the last, literally from 9 a.m. to 7.50 or something like that. And then we didn't have any middle or high schoolers, but they were later and then later. And it was so refreshing. Our children at the time were waking up between 5.30 and 6, and then school didn't start until 9. We were like, my God, who will fail the morning? And it was so nice when it did get adjusted. So I understand that parents will complain. Look at me at this meeting. I'm sure I'll complain, but I would be so happy for it to start with elementary, then go to middle, and then go to high school. And then, Kristen, I know you've showed that slide before, but I can't believe we have 95 start times for 12 schools. That's astounding. I don't know how you how you do that. Yes, it does seem also we could just create those bands. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Chris? Thanks. Great, yeah, I just wanted to chime in uh, one, to uh, to kind of encourage the the possibility of of uh, being open to a to a major rework and not just uh, ed, uh, nibbling around the edges as far as uh, uh, decrease you know increasing a little bit of space there between bell times. Um, but I also wanted to encourage everybody to learn from the calendar kerfluffle that we had when we tried to change the start date for school much earlier with just a few months notice rather than um, many, many months of notice. Um, and I would like to take off my transportation hat and put on my, I own a small business that offers classes for school age children hat and say that, uh, you know, we align our classes at Perfect Point Dance Studio specifically with school bell times um, to try and facilitate our kids transition from school uh, to dance class. And we set our schedule a full six months before the school year starts. Um, so this may be the kind of change that can't get 
decided in January and then implemented in August, it may need to get decided and implemented much farther into the future um, if you're not going to uh, throw a monkey wrench in every after school activity. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So looking at hold on, let me go back to this. Um, Elizabeth, did your hand just not go back down? Or did you have another thought? No, nope. and Chris, uh, you're good. So uh, with that, I will say as chair of ACTC, I'm a big fan of having this conversation with as much support as we can, because that is absolutely alternative transportation is not just about getting more, but using what we have as best we possibly can. So I know you have our full support, Kristen, in this, I'm sure, simple and straightforward and not controversial uh, endeavor. <laughs> exactly. So um, free fare on art, which I, I we need to come up with a uh, FFI is better than the first one I came up, which was free art. I'll let you do that acronym yourself. <laughs> um, so uh, I had to turn off my camera. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta laugh at this. OK, bring it on for us. All right. Well, good you evening. Just share your screen. Yeah, actually, it's just me. OK, it's just me. Um, uh, Lynn Rivers, I'm the Transit Bureau Chief and just wanted to uh, well, number one, thank you for for having me here and uh, coming back once again to talk about art. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and to update you on where we are in the discussion that that we have been having internally with regards to a um, a student, we're calling it a student fair less project uh, pilot. Uh, and, and this is uh, as a result of we've got some funds through the American Rescue Plan. And we've been talking about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we worked with uh, Kristen and worked with APS on the, the pilot that occurred with uh, APS back in 2019, um, and I think things were humming along, and then, all, of course, we all know what happened. And, uh, and so we're taking this opportunity to see, number one, how we can expand that program, and then also at the same time study to determine the implications in rolling it out full bore. And th this is a conversation that's happening all around the country, all around the region, all around the country with regards to fares, just public transit fares in general, but looking at specific areas because we already provide discounted fares for um, seniors, uh, those who are um, uh, the disabled community ride for free with a Metro Access card. Um, and obviously we have the iRide student discount, uh, which is literally half price or a dollar. Um, but with this pilot that we're planning, we are planned to do um, to target number one, uh, a number of different uh, students, student populations. So this is across across APS. We're not targeting specific schools, but in particular, we're targeting those areas where there are hubs. And, and as I think as I was joining, I heard you all talking about that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, consolidated uh, stops. Um, those students who are traveling out of their school zones to other schools like um, over to the career center. And um, and and there are other other schools that um, where uh, students are walking and they're pretty close to the very edge of their walk zones. And and the reason why we're doing this is because, number one, we're trying to understand what the impact will be on the resources that we have. So in any pilot, what you do is, you, you know, obviously you think think of the end game and where you want to get to, um, but also thinking about the parameters that you have and and trying to understand where there might uh, could possibly be um, any any impacts. And so the whole goal and I, you know, I say personally, when we are working on a pilot, the whole idea is to test it with the end goal being that we can fully implement it. And so that's why 
you see, um, you've heard us talk about uh, a specific number of, of students in order to, to make this work. Um, the initial uh, pilot that was done a couple of years ago, I believe targeted about a little over 200 students. Um, this particular pilot is larger. Um, we're focusing on about, we think there are about 24, 2,500 students that fall within the parameters that I mentioned. And the whole point, and also the other piece I'll say is to make it easy from an administrative side. For public transit, I know it looks simple, like there's a fare box and either you put money in it or you don't. But there's a whole lot that happens on the back end in order for us to even determine who's riding, how many people are riding. And in order to provide transit service, you have to understand where your populations are coming from in order to make sure that you're providing the service that's required. So um, a lot of this has to do with trying to make things simple, so simple from an administrative side that we can really start to focus on what does it mean to provide the service. Once we get through the pilot, and let me not say once we get through it, as we're going through this pilot, we will also be doing, uh, have a technical assistance grant where we actually will have a consultant to come in and work with us in determining all different levels of fares and, and not just student fares, but for different types of fares, whether it's a free fare during the day, a uh, certain uh, time of the day, or if it's certain routes. The, um, this is a wide ranging plan and it starts off being a little small, but the ultimate goal is to make it larger to allow more people to, to use the service, to have access to the service. So the plan right now is to use the iRide card, which is already acknowledged by our fare collection system. And the, we would load funds on the card in order for a student to have free rides, essentially, over the course of the school year. Um, that, and it, it sounds like something that's very simple, and we're looking at it from the standpoint, again, of trying to simplify it to the point that we can get students number one, and parents attracted to using the service, make it free, and for us to be able to just, you know, study it literally to see how it can impact the students and how it would impact the service. And when I say the service, I'm talking overall with regards to resources. Um, that is it in a nutshell. There's still lots more work to do. It's, it's uh, the, the board, uh, the county manager presented it and uh, it's gonna come uh, before the board um, at our next board meeting, but just wanted you to get a sense of what we're talking about and, and why we're discussing it this way. And uh, to understand that this is just the first of many others that will take place as we're finding our way to uh, looking at how we can roll it out um, uh, fully. So with that, I'll say, and, and Kristen, I, and obviously we've talked with Kristen about this to, to get her input um, and also want to uh, just uh, get your feedback or if there are any other questions that you have, but, but hopefully I've asked, answered some of the questions that you might have had so far. Well, thank you. And let me get to my list because that would be helpful. Um, and Jillian's going to open up the question session. I want to try to keep us on time here so let's keep it to about five minutes and we'll go from there great i am super super excited about this i've been you know ringing this bell for years literally years um my, my son just left but from when he was a little tiny baby um so i am so excited to see this i think it's uh putting it on the county side is the right thing to do i really appreciate county staff stepping up um i've been working on this for a long time that said I don't un I don't understand what the pilot is. I am super involved and I read the board report. I'm even on FAC. I'm like super, super involved and I don't get it, which is a problem because if if someone super involved doesn't get it, people aren't going to get it. And if they don't get it, they're not going to use it. And my concern is that we've set up the system that's really limited because we <coughs> want to do a 
pilot and we want to and I just don't understand. I understand why we want to study it, why we can't just open the door. If you look like a kid, you get in. No big deal. I understand why you would have to scan a card. What I don't understand is why this is such a cabined in program. It, the original pilot was really limited because of budget. This pilot, first of all, what is the criteria? Is it every high school and middle school student? What would they have to do to get the funds on the card? You know, that sort of thing. And why can it not just be if you have an iRide card, when you click it on the thing, that's it. It's just free. And yes, that would be like five bucks for the family. But, you know, why can't we do that? And oh, my I goodness. Should... My goodness, Jillian. My goodness. <laughs> I've got to answer all those questions. No, I and, and I do have the answers. Okay. Um, let's see. Let let me start from from uh, why we're focusing on a smaller group. Well, first of all, let me just step back one. So we put this pilot together pretty quickly. I'll say that up front. And so we were looking at all the various ways that we could do this. And as I mentioned, the biggest thing for us is the administrative back end. So the first thing we started thinking about was, oh yes, let's take the smart tube card and and the iRide card and just do it the way that you you suggested because metro and all the jurisdictions in the region are on the same fair collection process it would mean literally reprogramming all the fair boxes within the system i know it sounds crazy but it it does and, and there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes for that to happen. And quite frankly, we were trying to move really quickly to see what, what could we do that did not have such an administrative impact initially so we could start something. Um, and so I'll jump to the, you know, who is involved and what's the criteria. How about um, we're still working that through and um, the whole point is when we we talked about focusing on students who um, who are boarding at the consolidated stops, um, the you know on the outskirts of the walk zones, we were trying to put somewhat of a definition on who would be eligible to do that. So really, we could try to um, maintain a small enough group to study. I'll be quite frankly with you. Um, when, when you talk about pilot, when you start rolling it out to a lot, it's, it's kind of it's kind of hard for us to discern exactly where the impacts are. So it's it's baby steps, but it's I think it's it's enough for us to get our hands around it. And then we'll be able to look at how we can do all the things that you mentioned. So we've got there's more information It's I, I know it sounds very. I know it sounds pie in the sky right now. But it, it is very simple. It's it's simple, and we've not had a chance to even roll it out to explain and to go through all of the things that I'm telling you now. There's there's a lot yeah, more to come. There there is. There's definitely a lot more to come. Do we know the first? Do we have an anticipated date? I'm sorry, Chris, to jump in, but of when the first kid will be able to get on a bus for free? We we are trying to. We're trying. We're focusing on by January. But that means. Uh oh, I think we just lost Lynn. Let's see if she comes back. Lynn, you froze. Yeah, I'll chime in. This is Dennis while, while Lynn's coming back. Um, <laughs> what is in the um, um, action that will be before the board in November is a sufficient funding to launch the program in for the winter spring semester and then it provides funds to continue the pilot for all of the full school year the fiscal 23 school year and there is sufficient funding that actually could provide free transportation to and from school i believe lynn for 2400 students Yes. And I also yes. uh, want to just give you some additional parameters. Com Kristen went over the APS fleet, which is roughly 200 buses. Our total fleet is pretty much locked in at 78 buses to provide all service countywide 
and that fleet number is capped until 2025. Um, and that includes buses that are not in commission that are in repairs. So I think on any given day, we probably have about 60 buses or so that deliver service from Lynn 530 AM until 1230 or 1 AM in the morning. And we deliver right. service seven days a week. Um, but we're really excited about the potential of this and we want to get more students on on art and really learn what's working and what's not working. A lot of work with Kristen is ahead in the next couple months. So I want to try to move this, Chris. Let me get your question, then we'll wrap up with Kristen. Yeah, sorry, I'll try and be really quick. It's largely a comment at this point, um, which is I want to echo everything that. Well, I'm getting a ton of echo back from somebody's. Oh, sorry, uh, I want to echo everything that Jillian said. Um, I'm super excited about this pilot. I've been wanting this pilot for a, a long, long time. Um, I am really concerned. A, that there's not enough information for me to be, feel like I can go to the county board and say, yes, this is a good idea right now, or no, it's not. Like, because B, like getting the pilot wrong, right? Implementing this in a way that is super onerous or gives people a bad experience is going to mean this never gets out of pilot phase. And right now, I'm really concerned that it sounds extremely complicated. If you can't, explain the pilot in a sentence then we've messed up like it's got to be simple the criteria of who can take advantage of the of it during the pilot period has got to be extremely simple um and we've got to give people a good experience during the pilot program or this is never going to go anywhere uh, so i urge you to make this to set this pilot program up to be as simple as humanly possible um and as easy to explain as humanly possible that's all thank you All right, Kristen, wrap us up here. Yeah, I was just say so. Yeah, we've we've been talking about this because, of course, we did a pilot. We did a pilot in 2019 and 2020. Um, so I have a lot of infrastructure already in place um, that is going to help propel this thing forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, to Lynn's point, yeah, we were loading, we've loaded money on the IRIC cards. I mean, and that's basically what we're doing at this point. Um, so we, in fact, we have a meeting on Friday, right, to talk about implementation of what this thing looks like. Um, but, you know, on the upside, I got a lot of communication materials I already put out. Um, I already have kind of the schools are aware of what, you know, what we do, what needs to be done. Um, and I've had some kids, you know, some of them are still around from 1920 um, who have been asking about this and have been interested and um, kicking it back up again. So I think, um, as Lynn said, you know, we were looking for something that we could get going at the start of the next semester, essentially. Um, and using the kind of the infrastructure that we already had in place um, was a really good place to start. So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank okay. you. And Lynn, sorry, to, didn't mean to put you through the ringer on this. Um, and as soon as you have something that you could send to ACTC, we want to be your advocates. You have a lot of people on here who would love to see this go to, personally as chair, my vision is someday in the future that if it has a fare box and drives through Arlington that a kid can get on it for free. That That's our dream. So anywhere we can help you start that, we are we are all in. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We'll be in, we'll be in touch. Thank you. All righty. Um, so I hope you'll take some some feedback through some. Obviously, we don't have time tonight, but through some channel, take some feedback from some parents on on how to make it successful and how to you know the communications and stuff like that. Yes, yes, Kristen. Kristen is uh, is going to be a big help in all of this. Will be uh, pivotal in this. Kristen Thank is you. lovely, but I hope you'll reach out outside of staff. <laughs> oh no, that's what I meant. <laughs> She'll help me be. She'll help be the conduit. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, and um, Lynn, thank you for your your time this evening. I know you uh, appreciate that. So, pilot updates. Go for it, Kristen. And you're on mute. Listen. 
Um, way, did I hear way was way on today? Yes, I am. OK, um, I know we, were, we talked about this the other day, but the Lorcom sidewalk um, is. We're going to keep it right. Yeah, the Lorcom sidewalk when we introduced it uh, again for people who didn't hear about this uh, before. This is about 650 feet um, Lorcom from North Oakland Street to Quebec, uh, where the sidewalk on the north side uh, has a gap. And we introduced um, sidewalk, not really sidewalk, but we blocked off parking lanes to provide a uh, pedestrian pass through that uh, area during the summer um, of last year. And uh, supposedly we were supposed to actually take it out because that was a pilot for the COVID condition. However, we took some, uh, we took two steps afterwards. We had a community engagement, gathered information. We had online survey, gathered information, and uh, the majority of the responses support keeping it. We also uh, collected data that showed us within 24 hours, there's more than 50 pedestrians using it. So we considered the, the and we also got uh, feedback from uh, APS saying the school children are using it. So with all that information together, we will recommend to keep the setting in place. Uh, part of the reason that we feel comfortable recommending that is there is a bike lane right next to the parking lane, which means pedestrian is not being placed directly next to uh, uh, traffic. Uh, you know, without a actual curb. So yes. Uh, we're going to recommend this one. Uh, what we need to do next is we need to communicate to the neighborhood, which understandably uh, some of them are against uh, keeping it. So we're going to do our um, communication with the neighborhood and try to keep it. Uh, Chris and I will keep moving to Nanacostas as well. OK, yep. again, uh, some of you may have seen that, some may not have. I will, I actually have a picture, so let me share. This is a uh, really tactically in, uh, installed roundabout uh, at the intersection of Nanacostas and the Military Road. Um, you can see uh, that the entire uh, middle circle and the, also, you know, the narrowing of the lanes are introduced through markings and bollards. Even the pedestrian ramp here is a temporary uh, asphalt ramp. The reason we are doing this pilot is there is a CIP project slated to improve this uh, intersection, and uh, there were two options, uh, two alternatives for design. One is calling for a roundabout, another one is calling for a signal. And uh, there's some uncertainty about if the roundabout should the roundabout work or not. So we decided to uh, do a pilot introducing all these, you know, bollards and markings to uh, let the traffic behave such way and see how that goes. This being long time in the working, Kristen, I don't know how many community engagement we've, we've gone together, uh, but we finally uh, implemented about a week ago. We have done many adjustments ever since, uh, at least two major ones. We added additional warning sign, you know, um, uh, also recommended 15 miles per hour speed sign. We also um, uh, basically uh, added a um, additional guidance sort of uh, marking within the circle. We had a lot of feedback from the community. Uh, many of them are people who have not uh, heard of the project, like they, they didn't come to the engagement uh, part, but they saw that in, you know, being put in place. And there are comments about these, these things really look ugly. Uh, I just want to say you, they are right. These things are not meant to look good. They're meant to actually work in terms of uh, channelizing traffic. And should that uh, work out should the pilot give us a positive feedback, then we are going to look uh, to work with the CIP team 
to take that into a, a permanent uh, installation. Um, a little bit unnecessary detail for you. Uh, the, the final, you know, if we hardscape the roundabout, it's actually going to be uh, look better and also work better. Right now we're limited with a utility pole that you can see right here, which, you know, forced us to have not a circle, but almost like a half circle. Those are limitations of when you are not touching the actual civil part and just doing this um, pilot. Uh, we look forward for feedback from school and see how our students may be using it, you know, how people find it safe or not safe. I know Dennis did and myself did too. I went out uh, three times, drive all directions and uh, observe how traffic, including myself, <laughs> taking the formation and how we behave. I will say I notice people slow down noticeably, but of course there are also uh, um, the, the cars with trailer uh, hitting our sign in, you know, three days after and then my team has gone out to move around the sign, replace them. I hope the pattern will settle in the next uh, few months and give us a positive uh, result. That's all I have to say and I can take questions. Uh, first, thank you, uh, Wei, for helping get us uh, back on track. I appreciate that. Very succinct as always. Um, hands on this or are we uh, this just was uh, appreciate the feedback on that. I just put two things in the chat. We don't even have to discuss them, but if, if we will just read the chat, that'd be great. <laughs> OK, thank you. Awesome. Well, seeing no other hands again, um, first of all, way, thank you. You're not paid to be here, so I appreciate that. And um, I, I, you know, people say there's no creativity in engineering. I think there's lots of creativity and I appreciate yours. So thank you um, for everything you are trying and figuring out. Uh, the that. credit goes to the team, really. Uh, the team worked uh, through the weekend because that's the best time not to interrupt everyone's daily routine. And they also worked uh, multiple times, including in the rain, just to replace the sign that's been hit. Yeah. <laughs> Two days after putting it in, it's gone. Uh, but the team did a good job. I appreciate that. Too often it's they did this, and it's nice to put a face to they. So thank you. Um, Kristen, do you want to take us through uh, Safe Routes to School and Vision Zero and TDM? I'm seeing those Vision Zero signs all over the place. All right, well, let's see, Lauren uh, will give us an, an update on safe routes and then way we may need you back for uh, Vision Zero unless Christine is on. I can't remember if she was. Um, and then TDM uh, we will go to Zara and maybe Eric after that. OK, hey, uh, thank you, Kristen and Josh and everybody. Um, Safe Routes to School has attempted to get uh, back to business as usual, although business is not usual. Um, but we had our uh, walk, bike and roll to school day um, back on October 6th at Hoffman, Boston, and really have been focusing uh, completely on safety and walking and biking versus driving. It's not been fun and giveaways and all of that, although we've tried to do a little bit of that. Um, thanks to our, our partners with um, Arlington Transportation Partners and Walk Arlington and Bike Arlington. We made a little bit of a, a celebration of it, um, but the, the bottom line is we're messaging that it's not one day, it's every day, and let's do this right, do it safely, and everybody share the roads and the sidewalks and the crosswalks. Um, and we've gotten a lot of support from um, ACPD and our crossing guards and been working closely with them to, to continue um, messaging every day. Um, and then we we concluded the month pedestrian safety month with um, a celebration at Randolph Elementary, which was our focus school for the event this year. Um, and they unfortunately it was a rather deluge day as we all as way was just talking about on Friday and over the weekend. Um, but we had a celebration and we uh, kind of recognized Randolph for being the only uh, all walk zone school in Arlington and again encourage them to move on Monday, walk on Wednesday, use their feet on Friday, whatever it takes and get their parents to do the same thing. So um, then the other major thing that happens every fall with Safe Routes to School is the student travel tallies. Uh, during several weeks in October, we ask classroom teachers at the elementary level and health and PE teachers in middle and high school to do two days of counts 
of their students and how they are getting to and from school um, with the choices being walking, biking, uh, bus, school bus, uh, carpooling, transit, um, and other. And other includes everything from taxi, lift, Uber to skateboard and scooter. Uh, and those counts are being wrapped up now, we have a not a great return rate. We have about a 50% return rate so far, but this is a Google form that's being um, required to be submitted by Monday. So we're hoping that uh, a lot of that remaining percentage will be in by Monday, um, the, the 8th. So that's been ongoing, but we have eight years of data that we every, every October has been collected. So it's really an important exercise and it gives us a good insight as to transportation patterns, changes, where uh, improvements need to be made, whether, um, you know, which schools are doing what we had hoped, which schools maybe say they're doing what we'd hoped, but they're really not, and so on. So uh, we'll see how that shakes out. And usually by January or so, we have everything in and processed so that we can look at it um, in pretty graphs and uh, numbers. Um, and then finally, the, the third thing that's business as usual is the um, health and PE bike safety unit that uh, basically travels in a trailer. It's about 40 bicycles that travel from elementary school to elementary school every two weeks. Um, so we get through about half the elementary schools each year. And that's back on track, uh, starting with uh, schools that had never hosted before because they opened and then we had COVID and then now we're back. So that's all going as well as can be expected. And then on the um, not so much business as usual, but being creative uh, to try to make things work as best they can. Uh, we've been working with Bike Arlington and really Bike Arlington has been working with us on um, doing some bike train pilots at different schools at elementary. They had been working at the middle school level, but have found a little more receptive audience with the elementary school level and currently at Innovation. And we're about to start uh, talking to Barcroft Elementary School. Um, we have a great um, group of uh, seniors that are part of the Arlington uh, Committee on Aging, Aging, I believe that's the, the official name, um, who are working with us to pilot a senior-led walking school bus program. And we're going to be meeting with Oak Ridge Elementary School about that next week. And then uh, thanks to a grant from Safe Routes to School that was applied for by Walk Arlington, um, we just installed a story walk, which is another way to promote um, pedestrian safety messaging through creative means um, and available funds. Um, and that will be up for another month or so at Randolph. Unfortunately, it's not really open to the public, but the, the students will benefit from it. And the last of all, we've been uh, responding to the extent possible um, to uh, every, you know, every inquiry every request um every you know idea that we've received whether from families staff um, students and uh, we couldn't do any of that without our partners at the county and at, in the police department so um, that's just an ongoing thing but i think we've been pretty much on top of things and very responsive so that's uh that's my update if anyone has any questions Nope. So Jillian just put a thought in the oh sorry way um way put it in the chat to Jillian Jillian there so thank you I'm just gonna keep moving us along so Vision Zero. Uh, okay yeah so uh, Vision Zero is making a lot of progress. Uh, we are actually gonna host the external stakeholder meeting soon. Uh, we also are working on a mid-year report that that's going to, you know, uh, uh, give people a, a glance at, you know, what has been done and what is the progress. Uh, we also keep a very close eye on our website. We provide, you know, a, a lot of information on our website about the projects, including the pilot projects we're talking about or the quick builds and things like that. Uh, we did hear people asking, uh, uh, we, you know, uh, how come your projects, uh, if we put it on the map, how come it's more in this area versus that area? I will say right now we're focused on uh, throw everything we can think of on the website so people get informed. Uh, there could be projects that we didn't mention because they either has just been completed or, you know, uh, they've been tracked through other programs. 
So I will say, please be patient with us. Don't use that as the comprehensive list of all we do. That is part of what we do. <laughs> um, that's that. And uh, the one item that's most linked to the school activity right now is uh, the uh, slow, uh, the slow street around school, the 13 slow zones um, that's going to the board in the November meeting for the final adoption, uh, which is a ordinance uh, amendment. I do want to mention one thing that has not uh, been um, on our radar until recently is the global disruption of supply chain has, uh, you know, the ripple effects has really arrived and start to affect us. Uh, we have equipment contracts that uh, either the vendor uh, is asking for significant uh, cost increase, which, you know, is not going to be um, agreeable through a usual um, contract method. We may end up have to like rebid some of our equipment contract or uh, there are equipment that the vendor just can't get it to us uh, at the you know previous uh, delivery pace. And because of that, uh, we are really relooking at our inventory, um, including our signage, you know, sign inventory material and all that, and see how much we can take. So you may, uh, I hope not, but you may see a slowdown of uh, introducing uh, additional uh, projects with large quantity of signage. And I hope the effect goes away soon. And, you know, multiple county departments are working together, try to counter this um, impact, but that is really is beyond our control. So I'm just throwing this on the on the plate, um, plant the seed on the back of your mind. That that's a that's about it. And uh, I can take question if people have uh, uh, John has a hand. So yeah, Hui, um, I was sorry to see about that tragic accident this morning at Washington Boulevard in Sycamore. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I saw that and I also saw the picture on our now. Um, we actually got noticed uh, about uh, 10 minutes when uh, police heard about it. So um, we have not learned any details. You know, as usual, we'll wait until police uh, have more information to share with us. Right now, it looks like it's a two car crash and when uh, and what a van and a box truck and uh, a passenger got ejected from the vehicle. It's very unfortunate. Uh, we feel sorry about it. And um, we're going to look into that when we have more information. Uh, by the way, county staff and the police, we go through a quarterly meeting uh, to go through the critical crashes. And we, together, we identify, is there anything we can do from the engineering side? Um, and uh, you know, we, we always look to see if there's something immediate we can do, we will. Uh, sometimes we do find the crashes to be a little bit uh, unusual. And, you know, sometimes we, we feel like scratching our head and couldn't do anything. But this one, I have no further information yet. OK, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Jillian, real quick, because I want to keep us on time here. Yeah, um, and of course, there were the two students who were biking separately who were hit and and I haven't seen any county response by that. There was a bicycle advisory committee meeting on Monday. There was no, you know, uh, no mention of it, no special discussion of it. I'm, I'm kind of concerned by this. What What is the county um, doing for bike safety? Uh, uh, the question can be answered either short or the not long way. Uh, I, I will, I, for the <laughs> sake of time, I will not go through the things Candy did for bike and uh, both accessibility and uh, safety. Um, yes, we we feel sorry for those, you know, uh, crashes and we do look at them. I know at least personally a few days ago, we actually looked at the one where a car trying to pass a, um, a bike at Harrison and 22nd, I believe that's the location, and uh, uh, clipped the, the bike. Um, uh, there is not an immediate 
engineering solution to that. Uh, these things are the reason and these are the motivation and the drive for county staff to continue working on Vision Zero. Uh, I wish I have the magic wand. I can just wave and make things go away. Unfortunately, uh, I have to again rely on the team to look at these things and uh, identify a solution. I mean, this this is a place where there's a bite. She, the the girl who was hit in the um, instance you mentioned was hit after a bike lane disappeared. Whoa. There's no signage. There's nothing reminding drivers to give three feet when passing or to change lanes entirely when passing, which would be required in that in that location. It's a blind hill. And we see the result and I, I'm, I'm just I am very disappointed that the, you know this happened that our children are hit. There's very little response from the county. You know, and it's more business as usual. And I, I should mention they were both hit on areas that were called out in the bicycle element for improvement. So I want to move us. I, I, I hear you, Jillian, but I do want to move us. And you know, Wei's got has heard your heard your concerns on that one. So uh, John, did you have something quick? Or I'm sorry, not uh, John Armstrong. Yeah. Um wasn't sure this is the appropriate time, but I had a question about the, the signage around the slow around schools that currently exist that indicate that you know it's a slower you, drivers just slow down like a, you're in a school zone. Um, what, it, what in terms of when are those things turned on? I walk I happen to walk by one every morning over by Science Focus at about 8:25 a.m. and the sign is not blinking as I walk to my bus stop um, and I'm just curious what time how 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 what time before school starts do those things turn off because there are a lot of children at that school at 8 John, I, I, I believe uh, those times are designed to straddle the the arrival and the, the bell hour so at each school depend on the bell hour it could be different don't quote me on that. I think it's at least 30 minutes before. It could be longer. Uh, Kristen, do you do you know the exact number better than they do? I think I think it's 30 before and like five after. Right. Uh, John, yes. can you put the exact location in the chat? And maybe we can have someone see if they can just make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. If if it's something broken, please. Just you know, sending a service request will fix it. I know Lauren actually sent us a couple of times the the flashing beacon uh, uh, broken at um, Dorseyham, and uh, the moment we get that, my team is out there and they fix it in the same day. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's broken. I think I see it on my when I walk back home from the bus stop. Um, I just think it should be turned on earlier because there are plenty of kids already at the school for earlier activities. And you know, this morning somebody flew through it. Um, I happened to notice a car going very, very fast, and I looked up, and the thing's not blinking. I'll verify that it's, it does blink. Um, I'm just hoping they can be turned on for a longer period of time because there there are lots of people walking to and from through these schools prior to 30 minutes before the bus. That I do know. So yeah, if you yeah get that, go go check that, and if we can put an order in on that, I, I do need to keep it moving though because I want to make sure we get to TDM and then talk about Twelfth and Rolf. So okay. who's doing who's doing TDM? Um, I can give a really brief update just for the sake of time. Um, I have been working on with Henry uh, with Bike Arlington about capital bike share. Um, some of the recent changes that have happened um, on the back side of things. Last month, they actually updated the pricing for the first time in five years to increase the cost of the annual memberships, um, but they've also made some changes to the model itself and how things are priced along. So now there's going to be um, a price per minute uh, for e-bikes and they've extended the price, uh, the duration, the trip duration um, for trips included for memberships from 30 minutes to 45 minutes for each trip. Um, so I've been working with Henry on communicating out those changes to um, APS teachers and staff that have access to the free Capital Bike Share memberships. Um, we're going to be hosting a webinar next week um, with APS employees and Arlington County staff that also have access to that free membership. 
Um, but another thing I wanted to just bring up in case you guys weren't aware, um, with everything that's been going on in the Metro derailment, ongoing investigation, um, and, and the delays um, that we've seen with Metro Rail throughout the region, um, DDOT did announce that they're going to be offering free 30-day memberships um, to help people get around during the disruptions. And we did confirm that that does apply to all jurisdictions within the service area for capital bike share. So that includes uh, anyone in Arlington that wants to take advantage of that membership. So um, if you guys wanted to share some of that information, I can also provide a flyer. Um, but we have some more information on our website on atp.com. Um, but if anyone has any questions about that, just let me know or reach out to me or Henry. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, you know, anything you send my way, of course, I can push it out to the group. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Last on the agenda is our better to know some intersections. Kristen, uh, we're going to an intersection close to my heart because my son went to um, Hoffman, Boston. Um, so how are we doing this today? Let's see, I, um, I've got it on my screen. Let me share and bring it up. See if it will cooperate. Are we there? It's trying. There it is. All right. Um, let me just do you. OK, so um, we are going to swing in here. Um, so we had um, we met with um, the Hoffman Boston PTA to talk about the slow zone demonstration project, and this was um, a an intersection that I think they were interested in um, seeing if there could be some improvements. Um, 12th to 12th and Ralph, right? EP, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, of once the, uh, what's that? Yeah, you got it. Yep. So, um, because when, when the, uh, when the Trove, um, uh, project was completed, uh, this road over here was completed mm -hmm. and then, um, the walk zone was expanded to allow students to walk from the other side. Uh, through because there's now the completed uh, street. So, um, but this one they said a bit has been very busy here. Um, so let me see, we'll bring it, bring us here, get some, our little person here. Um, so um, that I would put it on our list to talk about today. Although one thing I did realize when I looked at it earlier this week is that they're still showing sort of the incomplete um, construction project over here. It doesn't seem that we have a newer version of this at the moment. So let me try something. It's about the same thing, except there's a whole lot of cars on all four corners. OK, so um, and I know way that I think we I think there was a new and Josh, you've probably been walking over there fairly recently was we did. I feel like there was a crosswalk that did go in here recently. Is that right? They striped the south side of the. Uh, yeah, right there that if you go across that side of it, they striped. There, uh, OK, to, no, no, the other that's the that would be north. It's, OK, so this side. Let's see if I'm right. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. my wife walks that every day, so. OK, um, so we've got a crosswalk here. Um, but as you said, it's full of cars. Lauren, I know you you've been over at Hoffman Boston fairly recently. You were there for walk and bike to school day. Um, but you may have been a little closer to the school, so maybe have not observed over here. Um, but I yeah, think I was you know, maybe closer. yeah, 13th and Queen is where I was that day. So way I, you know, we kind of look to you to um, help us understand if there's anything that can be done here, because I think Josh, we, you know, since you're over there, is this where we've got the cars? There's a lot of cars here. Is that right? So the cars, I'm trying to get my thing, are all the west side. So if you're coming out from the apartments and you're trying to make a right, or coming out of that apartment row, yeah, well, you're is right there. You almost are completely blind. 
because there's cars parked on both sides on the west there, and I, I've had many a scary moment. Um, and while people are, of course, you know, pedestrians do what pedestrians do, is they will cross there on that south, um, across Roth Street on the south there, and then they will jump across um, 12th Street. And you, it's kind of dangerous because, like I said, there's cars on both sides of things. And I always, you know, it's a fine balance because you do have an older neighborhood with not always a lot of off-street parking. And so the sympathy is there. And it's mostly Wakefield. There's a lot of Wakefield kids because they're taking the bus. They walk to the hub stop over there near Hoffenbossen. And there's a hub stop in front of Hoffenbossen where Drew, I think, or Claremont, one of the option schools, has a very large bus stop there. So there's a lot of kids walking that way too. Well, thank you. I was wondering whose voice that was that I heard. So you stopped sharing, so you're sharing all, of, I'm, I'm looking now at Now I'm sharing you. Yes. Um, okay, so yeah, okay. So they're walking, they're over here, okay. Yes. I did check with my team about the detail of this intersection. There are a few things happening here and in actually that neighborhood. The first item is, the slow street uh, project, we extended beyond the 600 feet, sort of a typical length away from school at this location. We actually extended so that the 20 miles per hour speed limit will start from this intersection, starting from uh, 12. So that is actually, uh, we purposely um, extended the length to, to cover that, hopefully, you encourage uh, better uh, vehicular behavior. Another thing we're doing is this is a location that's under investigation for an always stop. We are waiting for Very data nice. to come in because uh, we did not collect data, especially the, the pedestrian data that's related to school kids. And so we did not collect any data uh, until, no, let me take it back. We did not order data until after September, and uh, there's some, you know, uh, data come backlog. We are anticipating data to come in uh, any day now, because this one actually belonged to the first batch of data we're going to receive. Um, I will say, based on the new um, uh, apartment building and also the school activity and all that, uh, I shouldn't make that guess. I would just say chances of this one may uh, warrant a always stop. I, I personally feel it's high. Um, of course, uh, we go with data. We also go with the school factor. Uh, when when there's a school nearby, when it's a critical intersection on the uh, walk to school path, we usually will give it more weight. So uh, please just be a little bit more patient. I'm hoping we can have something coming out. Okay. And um, that may that may calm down the traffic and i think it's there's a chicken in the egg aspect going on with the number of parents walking or driving their kids to school from those apartments and their comfort level crossing 12th and rolf right uh, understood and uh, which is why we always have that school factor we use our engineering judgment uh utilize the school factor to to see uh if we can uh, make it more sort of uh, helping school out. Uh, I believe, uh, Kristen, if I remember right, uh, on 12th and Scott, uh, we actually had, we built some um, crosswalk, including introducing newer ramps and stuff um, in the past year or so. I remember yep. reviewing the design plan. Um, and I also think that is the location where uh, you brought it to us. Uh, at the beginning so yeah. and that okay. one actually is having a neighborhood conservation improvement plan there too okay so again this area uh, we are uh putting uh, effort in there and um I, I hope something gonna come out better awesome chris awesome just wanted to say uh i'm really glad the county is is pulling counts for a possible all-way stop because the amount of traffic coming through there since we uh, connected uh, Trove um, is certainly uh, it been an increase, um, which I think we all should have, <laughs> we all saw coming. Uh, 
it would be lovely if we could come up with a way in the future to sort of anticipate these things before it becomes a problem um, when we know development is coming in and is likely to generate some traffic, uh, you know, slightly off site. Um, yeah. And then I also wanted to say, sorry, I'm just trying to be quick. Um, it would seems like it would really help if we could, you know, throw some bollards in there to bump out those corners. Those turn those corner radii are like absurdly. They just support really high speed turns the way they are. You know, a car can really cut all of those corners. Um, so hopefully it would be something the NC project will will do in concrete. But it seems like it would be nice to be able to do a quick build or tactical, uh, you know, bump outs on some of those corners to uh, shorten that crossing distance and uh, keep those cars from making a quick turn. Thanks. So, uh, Chris, I think you, the I just want to add to Chris's thing. the um, the curb cuts and stuff are coming to 12th and Scott. I think you were talking about adding bump outs at 12th and Rolf. Is that what you were suggesting? Yes, thank you. I missed that the NC project is up at Scott. Yes. So wait, is that a possibility if it warrants the four wave stop to add the, the bump outs as well? Or is that probably more than um, can be done in a quick hit? Uh, we can take a look into that. Uh, the curb bump outs usually also come with marking. Uh, oh, I'm afraid this marking season is really coming to an end. So if anything was a curb, you know, tactical curb bump up, that will be uh, next year. But the stop sign can go in now if we uh, warrant that. So you, you may see again a, uh, let's do something first, <laughs> uh, uh, this, uh, progress. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Jillian? Yeah, thanks. So um, I was actually asking about the curb cuts in on these corners. They look new and they are they look really uh, unpleasant to use. Um, if you go back to the street view, one of them has a pole in the middle of the curb cut. I can't imagine navigating like a stroller or a wheelchair around the curb cut and all four of them point you into the middle of the intersection um, or or not even in yeah so the, there's the pole in the middle of the curb cut and and then all four point you in the middle of the intersection so if you're on wheels at all bike stroller skateboard wheelchair you you end up not being able to use a, a crosswalk when this is the curb cut and i actually i'm surprised that's why i asked when they were built because these were built with a project on langston boulevard um and we were told the county doesn't do this anymore. That was a VDOT project. The county never does these, um, which I I took to heart because I find these very dangerous and hard to use. Um, I understand that the marking season is over, but this seems like a, a situation that would warrant figuring out a solution that may not be the ideal, but gets us um, you know, it just makes it safer, um, especially because I don't, it seems like people walking here would be forced out into the street just because the sidewalk is so poor. These ramps does look like uh, a pre-current standard era. I don't know when they were put in. They, they don't actually look like the newer standard uh, to me. Um, yeah, I know like the only thing I would mention is that we, we may want to just follow up with our our water sewer streets bureau. This this to me looks like basic concrete maintenance. This is not. I don't believe that was a capital project. Yeah, it doesn't. It was probably look like basically it. just replacing bad sections of concrete and putting in ramps. Um, but we can follow up to find out when it was done. I, I, it doesn't look like a project. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, if that, hopefully, if if you had this. You know, if you came to a spot in Arlington where you needed to replace concrete because the concrete was really breaking, you wouldn't, and, but the design was bad. You wouldn't replace bad design with new concrete in the bad design. And maybe maybe we've identified sort of a, a process improvement that when Water Cedar Streets is just replacing concrete and it's, I, I don't know exactly how to make it happen, but they don't replace bad design with bad design. They go ahead and bring it up to a safe design. 
Um, but I, I appreciate I appreciate you chiming in and understand that you're you would need to do some research into how that happened. Cool. Wait, thank you. Um, I want to thank you again I, for as chair and also this is it personally because this is my neighborhood and um, it's been a long, long journey. We're thoroughly excited from like the walkability that was created when the Trove project put that in to begin with. So obviously it was a it cascading effect because there was it went from almost no pedestrian activity to, you know, hundreds of opportunities over a pandemic. So thank you um, for everything with that. Did you, we only have about three minutes? Did, did you want to highlight anything from another project or are we? Um, or are we about uh, about wrapped up here? And I do see I think it. We're done. That was just really for in case there were any updates on things that we've talked about um, in the past. And that was sort of left over from last time, too. And I thought I'd just leave it there in case. Jillian, is that an old hand or do you have one more thing to add before we close out here? Sorry, is there an update on the concrete? Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, survey the the survey of sidewalks throughout the county. Um, I latest heard from uh, Water Sewer Streets that their survey has uh, completed, but they are wrapping up uh, getting the report together. They're also doing the QAQC of that report. Um, and uh, I've asked them to share with me as soon as they have a report. Uh, so I'm I'm also uh, eagerly waiting for a uh, result because we think that's going to shed a lot of light into our you know program. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to be really big. Well, with that, um, I am going to yield back everyone a minute and a half of their time if I could have a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. That was uh, Jillian and then John and all in favor, we will say aye. 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 And I once again, I thank the members of this committee and I do especially thank the staff who are doing this as well. We come together and great things are happening. So thank you all. Thank okay. you. Good night. And Josh, thank you for everybody. us on time. I, I'm sorry, Way. Thank you for keeping us on time. Exactly. Woohoo. Another on if time. If you stop the recording, you should have access to that transcript. Excellent. <laughs> Stopping recording now. Thank you. Thank you all. And